Hello and welcome back to Algebra, the video series where we talk about some basic constructions like rings, groups and fields. And in today's part 3 we are still at the beginning and we talk about semigroups. In particular we will talk about neutral elements, also called identity elements and inverses. However, as always before we start, I really want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via Patreon. Okay, and now as in the last video, we fix a set S and a binary operation and then we call this pair a semigroup if we have associativity. So this is what we will have for the whole video and now we can say what we mean by a neutral element. Indeed, this should be an element E that does not do anything under the operation. So the result E circ A is A again. And if we had that for every element A in S, we would have a neutral element E. So this is what you can remember, it simply acts as an identity under our binary operation. However, since you already know that the order matters, we should also look at this thing the other way around. This means if you apply E from the right hand side, you also want to get A again. Hence, this idea here leads us immediately to the formal definition for these identity elements. So for any element E in the semigroup S, we define three names. The first attribute here is left neutral, which we often also call a left identity. And now you already know what this should mean. If we multiply E from the left to any element A, then we don't change this element at all. So the important ingredient here is that this holds for any A in S. Okay, and then you also know how we can define the attribute right neutral. And also here, very often you see that E is called a right identity. And now not so surprising, this means if you apply E from the right hand side, you don't change any element A in S. Okay, and now obviously, as mentioned above, we can put both notions together. And then we simply say E is neutral or an identity. So this means at the same time it's a left identity and a right identity. So obviously this is the most important notion here, but we don't have it all the time. Indeed, sometimes it might be already good enough to just have a left neutral element. In order to see that, let's take an example consisting of matrices. And here I want 2 times 2 matrices, where only the first row has non-vanishing entries. So we have this form here and x and y come from R. And as the binary operation, we just take the matrix multiplication. And now it's not hard to show that this gives us indeed a semigroup. So for example, you can already use that you know that the matrix multiplication is associative and then you just need to apply the closure law from the last video. More concretely, this means you have to show that you don't leave this set here with the matrix multiplication. Okay, and then I can immediately tell you that we have a left identity here. And this is 1, 0, 0, 0 and we apply this matrix from the left now. Therefore, we take an arbitrary element from our set S. And now we just do the usual matrix product, which means we have x here, 0 there, and y here and 0 there. So we see, we get the same element out again. This implies this matrix here is our element E and it's a left neutral one. However, it's only that because it's not right neutral at all. And of course we can check that because we can do the matrix multiplication again. But now we do the multiplication from the right hand side. And then we just get x0 in the first column and 0, 0 in the other one. And now you see, this is in general not the output we expect from a right neutral element. In fact, we can simply write down an example where we just put in 2's for x and y and then we see this is not the same matrix again. And this is the counter example we want. We don't have this equality here for every element A in S. So it's not a right identity, but still a left identity. So this can definitely happen, but now at this point you might ask, do we have some uniqueness for these identities? And this question immediately leads us to the next important fact. 
So here, let's assume that we have a left identity and a right identity. And let's call the left neutral element E and the right neutral element E tilde. So this means we have these two equalities here for every A and B in S. In particular, the first one should also hold if we choose E tilde for A. So we get E circle E tilde is equal to E tilde again. Moreover, a similar thing we can do with the second equation, because instead of B, we can write E. Hence, there we get E circle E tilde is equal to E. Therefore, we immediately see here on the left hand side, we have an equality. And you know how equalities work, which means we also have that on the right hand side. Hence, E and E tilde coincide. This is important because it immediately tells us two things. First, if we have a left neutral and a right neutral element, we get a neutral element. And second, this identity is unique. There is no other identity element in S. So please remember that in a semigroup, there can be at most one neutral element. Okay, with that important fact in mind, we can go and define so-called inverses. Indeed, inverses only make sense with respect to the given neutral element. So the assumption here is that we take a semigroup with an identity and we call it E. And if we assume that, we also know this is the neutral element. There can be no other. Moreover, let's also take two arbitrary elements AB from S. Okay, and then we can introduce three different names again. Now, first let's take an element x from the semigroup and we call it a left inverse of the given element a if x circle a is equal to the identity. So you could say x is an element that brings a to the neutral element. However, the important ingredient here again is that you put x from the left to a. Because if you do it from the other side, we would speak of a right inverse. And this is the next definition, y in S is called a right inverse of b, if b circle y is equal to e. And then the last definition is again, if we have both things together. So we quickly say, z in S is called an inverse of a, if we have both equalities here. And maybe not so surprising, this is the definition we will use the most. Moreover, I should also tell you that in the first two definitions, A and B also get names. First, A is called left invertible and B is called a right invertible element. So this makes sense and maybe to avoid confusion, let's use another letter here in the last equality. So now the element is called C and it's called an invertible one. So invertible means we have an inverse for this element and left invertible, for example, just means we only have a left inverse. So invertible here is definitely the stronger notion. But I would say we should discuss that with an example. And again, as in the last video, I want to look at a set of functions, but now defined on the unit interval. So we have all the functions from this interval into the interval again. And if we denote this set with f, and the circle denotes the composition of functions, then we know that this is a semigroup. Moreover, we also know we have a neutral element given by the identity map. So this is just a map that sends x to x again. Indeed, this is not hard to check that under the composition of functions, this is our neutral element. And now I give you a map f that is right invertible. Namely, this is a function that sends x to 4 times x minus 1 half squared. And maybe to get an idea for this function, let's sketch the graph of it. In fact, if we have 1 and 1 here, we see it's a nice parabola. Moreover, it's not hard to see that the 0 is exactly at 1 half. And at this point, you might already know that we can get an inverse of such a function if we reflect the graph on the diagonal. So this means we would get a picture like this. However, obviously this does not define a function and we have to get rid of some parts to get the uniqueness in the x variable. 
and one immediate possibility is to just ignore the whole lower part here. And then you might already know what we get is a square root function. More precisely, it will be the function x sent to one half of the square root of x plus one half. And now, if we form the composition of both functions, we see that g is a right inverse of f tilde. Indeed, this should not be so surprising, because this is exactly how we have defined the function g. We definitely wanted that f tilde after g is equal to the identity map. Moreover, now we can also check that the other way around, it does not work. So g is not a left inverse, it's just a right inverse. In fact, you should note that we have the right inverse here, because f tilde is subjective. So therefore, please remember that, subjective means we have a right inverse. So subjective and right invertible mean the same thing in this context. And in addition, we also see that left invertible means exactly that we have an injective function. So you see, these left and right notions we have learned today definitely have some important applications. But still, often we want to have the stronger notion, we want to have inverses. And in fact, this will immediately lead us to the definition of a group. And this is what we will discuss in the next videos, so I really hope we meet again. Have a nice day and bye bye.